Well, good afternoon, everyone, from wherever you might be tuning in, and welcome to this session where we look forward to talking about the solutions in getting to net zero emissions, spanning clean energy to energy efficiency and clean materials. Amidst a sometimes frustrating global political narr narrative of what we can't do, we want to dedicate today's session to talking about what we can do. What does net zero emissions look like? How do we get there? What are the solutions we have now? And what are the solutions that we need? My name is Anna Freeman and I'm a policy director at the Clean Energy Council in Australia, which is the peak body for the renewable energy sector. Our organisation represents over 950 member companies working across the solar, wind, hydro, energy storage and renewable hydrogen sectors. You hear a lot about the climate mitigation intransigence of Australia's federal government at the moment, but the renewable energy sector in Australia has in fact delivered a lot over the past five years doubling the share of renewable electricity within the national grid and achieving the largest rollout of rooftop solar PV per capita in the world, per capita in the world. And that's just one example of what the business sector, partnering with communities and governments, can deliver if given the chance. Renewable electricity is, of course, um, of course gives the world the opportunity to decarbonise other sectors and we'll be discussing that today. But there are also other hard to abate sectors where neither renewable electricity or renewable hydrogen can do the job. And we'll be exploring those too. And finally, we'll also be considering some of the skills that will be essential to lead the net zero transition across the global economy and the scaling up we'll need for our workforces to meet the challenge. My organisation, the Clean Energy Council, is a member of the International Council for Sustainable Energy, which has co-convened this session today. It was formed almost two decades ago with our counterparts at the US Business Council for Sustainable Energy and the European Business Council for Sustainable Energy, known as E5. This, is a, this alliance, formed to provide a voice for the global sustainable energy industry, is pleased to present today's session in association with the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, known as the IEEE. The panel we've assembled today represents a wide spectrum of expertise from the fields of business, research, technology development and engineering. And I'm very much looking forward to the range of perspectives that this distinguished group will bring to today's discussion. So without any further ado, let me introduce our speakers who join this session, both virtually from around the world and from the Scottish Events Campus in Glasgow. I might go to the room first. I think we have Mr. Collier Cousset, Chairman of E5, the European Business Council for Sustainable Energy, based in Germany. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Tariq Durrani, Professor at the University of Strathclyde's Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering, also representing the, um, in, representing the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And I think Tariq might be the only um, Scots, Scotsman on the panel today. Um, virtually, we also have Professor Thomas Brook, uh, Ch Chair of Th Synthetic Biotechnology at the Technical University of Munich, um, Tanya Peacock, if she is able to join us, we've been having some technical difficulties, from Bloom Energy, a provider of fuel cell and microgrid solutions based in California. Tom Freya, CEO and co-founder of Freya Battery, which is developing environmentally friendly lithium iron based battery cell facilities in Moirana in northern Norway and Dr. Bruno Mayer, an expert in power systems with decades of experience working across energy and telecommunications, also representing the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. So you'll see we have a wide range of ex expertise and perspectives to bring to bear upon today's topic, and I'm looking forward to a really interesting discussion. We have a little over an hour to cover a wide range of topics and there'll be an opportunity provided towards the end for questions as well from our audience. So please feel free to type in your questions as we go and I'll endeavour to pick up a few of them if there are any. Uh, to get started, I'm going to begin with a very simple question um, to our panellists and I invite you all to keep your responses fairly brief. Um, but I guess the key question really is, why are you participating and why is your organisation participating in COP this year. And I might start with those that are there in person. Um, Kolya, would you like to start? Kolya from E5, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
Yes, I, I am here representing the uh, Business Council for Sustainable, the European Business Council for Sustainable Energy, uh, and uh, a small startup company in Germany called Clean Carbon Technology. And we are here to uh, promote clean energy, clean materials for the future, and especially also uh, the topic of uh, energy efficiency, because all of this is needed to, uh, to reach the 1.5 degree target. And that's why we are here to bring the solutions uh, uh, onto the table uh, to, make, to make it uh, to, to, to stay un, uh, under 1.5 degree. That's the, the main message from our side. Glad to have you. Uh, Tariq Durrani, over to you from the IEEE. Thank you, my channel. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, colleagues. I represent the IEEE, which is the world's largest organization of professional engineers with some 450,000 members in 200 countries. And our raison d'etre is really to promote technology for humanity. I'm over here primarily to convey a message that engineers and engineering organizations have a critical role, an important role to play in delivering the net zero targets that governments have committed to. And I hope to show in this discussion how our organizations and organizations similar to us would be able to deliver on that. Excellent. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that later in today's session. Um, let's turn to Thomas Brook, head of Werner Siemens Chair, Synthetic Biotechnology at the Technical University of Munich. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, my research group uh, for decades now is focusing on developing and delivering uh, carbon neutral and carbon negative solutions for the generation of biofuels and biomaterials. Um, I'm also a member of the German National Bioeconomy Council. And with that, um, I'm very focused on delivering technology solutions for meeting the 1.5 degree goal and really look beyond this uh, and look for solutions to capture and eliminate carbon from the atmosphere. Fantastic. Well, we are very glad to have you on the case. Um, now to Bruno Mayer, um, consultant in energy and telecommunications representing the IEEE. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. Uh, the main reason why I'm here at COP26 and for which I'm very pleased to be part of this panel is that COP26 gathers experts from around the world, from uh, different uh, sectors of society, uh, stakeholders, government organization, experts from companies, large and small. And also, as a member of the IEEE, I'm thriving at, at advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. And in that respect, climate change mitigation is a key objective. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's hear now from um, those that are in the business community and um, leading some uh, new technologies in the field. Tom Jensen from Freya B Batteries. Over to you. Well, well, first of all, thank you for inviting us. And it's, of course, an honour to be part of this prestigious event. It's the 26th time that world leaders are and others are gathering to do something that matters. So, well, <clears throat> To meet the one and a half degree target of the Paris Agreement, we obviously need to cut CO2 emissions roughly in half already by 2030. Uh, and to do this, we need action at unprecedented scale now. Uh, and we need to act immediately to decarbonize not only transportation, but also energy systems globally. And from our vantage point, batteries and decarbonized batteries produced with renewable energy is key to enabling this transition. And Freyr was founded uh, <clears throat> with that in mind. I am at COP26 to urge leaders and governments and industry to act quickly. We need to collaborate through broad public-private partnership initiatives. It is possible to envisage rolling out large volumes of decarbonized batteries to accelerate this transition. And we are here to tell the world that we are ready, we're open, and we are you know, uh, ready to take our part of, uh, of the responsibility to, to mitigate climate change. Thank you, panellists. I was also hoping we would hear from Tanya Peacock, but I think she may not have managed to join so far. Speak up now, Tanya, if you're there and I can't see you. Otherwise, we'll press on and hope for a little bit of uh, 
a bit more gender balance as well as we press on throughout the, um, the rest of the program as well. Well, uh, the first theme that I really wanted to cover today was um, starting with a, a note of positivity about the, what the future could look like. We need to drive emissions down uh, to zero in just three decades. Uh, so let's begin at the end. What does net zero look like? And what are some of the key changes that we expect to have realised by then in order, if, if we, in fact, we, we do achieve this goal by 2050, net zero emissions, what does the world look like? What are the key changes? Over to you, Tom Jensen. So thank you, Anna. So, so I think, um, in a way, I'm Norwegian, so I'm calling in from Norway today, and we actually do have a 100% renewable energy system in Norway. Um, and we do have the largest penetration of uh, electric vehicles on the planet. Uh, so in terms of decarbonizing transportation and energy systems globally, we are in a way, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost like a, a, a preview into what you can imagine, right? Uh, so that means that we have institutionalized knowledge in how to do that. But, but uh, to answer your question, um, we quickly need to decarbonize our energy and transportation systems to go to net zero. That means that all transportation solutions need to be non-emitting. And in all aspects, that includes, of course, batteries in massive amounts and also fuel cell solutions and hydrogen solutions. But it's equally important to deploy storage and batteries into the energy systems globally. Uh, as most people know, today, 20% of the energy systems globally are renewable. And we need to move to a situation where 20% of the energy system is non-renewable by the next 20, 30 years. And that cannot happen without batteries. And therefore, these batteries need to be decarbonized themselves. So what you will see is massive influx of solar and wind and other renewable solutions. But they need to be supported by and catalyzed by large battery solutions as well. We already have an amazing invention that was invented 30 years ago which is called lithium-ion batteries. We've scaled up supply chains. We've scaled up production systems. There are a number of different entities and companies that are moving into this realm. And we really just need to do more of what we have done better, faster, and just repeat and repeat and repeat. So it's not like as if we need to reinvent the wheel. We continuously need to improve the solutions, which you know is already happening. We need to improve the supply chains. We need to localize the supply chains. We need to decarbonize the supply chains. But all of this is something that is already in the making. So what I believe, you know, the wor a world that is decarbonized is a world where renewable energy is the predominant solution into the energy systems globally, where all the vehicles, you know, going around are electric in some way or, you know, powered by batteries and fuel cells. Uh, and, and that's what renewable, uh, a renewable energy system looks like. So that's what a decarbonized future looks like. And therefore, as a Norwegian, I invite everyone to look to Norway because we kind of have a sort of preview to what that could look like already today. Fantastic message there. We have the technology already. All we need to do is get on and deploy it and improve it as we go. Um, why don't we turn to Bruno Mayer, who has worked himself for a long period of time in power systems and engineering. Bruno, what do you think? What, does, what do you think the fundamental, uh, some of the fundamental shifts uh, that we have to look forward to um, in a net zero emissions reality. Thank you, Anna. I want to give an optimistic view, but also express my own uh, realistic uh, views on the challenges that are ahead of us. Uh, of course, the growth in renewable energy sources has been fantastic over the past years. It is important to underline that there are two kinds of renewables. The ones which are the classical, like hydropower, also uh, biomass, and the one which are uh, based on solar and wind. Solar and wind is part of the large growth in renewables, and these are called intermittent sources. The wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't shine always, it doesn't shine at night, and so on and so forth. This represents a challenge if we want to guarantee a quality of supply of electricity. To this date, most of the power grid operators have been able to meet the challenge, and this is the great news. 
Now, the share of renewable intermittent sources will be increasing, and this means further challenges. This will necessitate special technology to be able to guarantee security of supply. To do this, the power grid, the electricity grid is fundamental, and I feel that we will meet the challenge but some development are needed. It's not just a question of saying, we're moving in that direction and let's let it be done. It needs an effort, but I'm very optimistic. Fantastic. Thank you, Bruno. Yes, there's a few um, areas I know that, and we will come to in a moment, that are, um, are posing some challenges as we get to higher penetrations of renewables, and that's worth um, teasing out today. Um, I might just on this, this one question of what, what might have changed, what looks different in 2050, what do we have to look forward to? Um, I might turn to Kolya Kuse from E5 to maybe round out the responses to this question before we move on. Kolya, what have you got to add, I suppose, particularly from your perspective of clean materials um, that I know you do a lot of work on? What, what do you think, um, what are the solutions we will have had to have address in, in order to get to where we need to? Um, I was attending um, a session that the French uh, government had in the end of 2019 and Emmanuel Macron said to all of us, uh, this was in December, 12th of December, I remember very well, we are going to fail while running out of time. So uh, we need to, to, to utilize the, the little time we have left to really uh, identify what is uh, still missing in all the uh, equations to, to keep the 1.5 degree target. And that's what, what he actually meant. So renewable energy alone uh, is not only the final solution. We, uh, at the end of the day, that's what the scientists tell us. We need carbon negativity and store carbon away safely. And that can be only done by materials. So we need to understand the importance of the underestimated topic of materials, of new materials that we eventually need to create a, a carbon sink uh, that is scalable and provides ultimate uh, safe carbon storage. Um, uh, 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 material E5 is working on to, to promote its carbon fibers as a scalable solution which is available here and today. And uh, there are certain parts missing uh, in the chain to develop this, uh, so we need to introduce some innovation and uh, new uh, uh, technology and patents in low and neg negative carbon emissions. Uh, but the IPCC SR 1.5 states very clearly that we need these carbon sinks. Without them, uh, our, our future systems will not be able to meet the 1.5 degree C target. Thanks, Collie. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about the clean materials space. I think it's a very exciting one. It's one we don't hear enough about. Um, so we'll come to that a little bit later when we talk about the harder to abate uh, problems that we have across the economy. Let's now turn to the question of um, the power sector transition because um, a large part of the uh, mitigation that is possible is in fact through um, renewable energy. But of, of course, um, um, there, is a, there is a challenge in the integration of renewable energy within our grids. I, I note comments by Tom and, and also by Bruno uh, in this regard. I'll just give a quick example of Australia where over the last, as I mentioned in my introductory comments, we've, we, over the last five years or so, we've doubled the share of renewable energy within the market. And I know that there's a lot of work and planning um, that has had to happen and is st still yet to come um, in terms of how we integrate large larger portions of, of renewables within the system. Um, so I really wanted to put the question to the panel, I guess, about what are the challenges in that renewable energy integration specifically? Um, how are the different regions, um, every, every country's experience is different, every region's experience is different. How are the different regions going in, in managing those and, and what solutions will be important for us to be able to operate at very high levels, if not 100%, or even higher, of, um, of renewable energy 24-7. Uh, uh, I will first go to, I think, um, uh, Bruno, just to, to I guess, uh, round out some of your comments from earlier. 
Yes, thank you, Anna. Uh, I, I've got uh, two ideas that are, not two ideas, two main streams that need to be looked at. To have an increased share of renewables and intermittent renewables in particular, it's very important to favor uh, interconnection between grids. I'm going to give a simple example. There is a development of wind energy in Spain, which has been very strong over the years. This led to further interconnection between Spain and France in order both to export wind energy when it was in excess in uh, uh, Spain. And, and, and this was, by the way, backed financially by Europe because they, they feel that this is a way of sharing this renewable energy. The other issue is that of connecting the grid internally. I'm going to give another example, which was uh, the German example, where the development of wind energy was very strong in the north of Germany, and the load where people need and industry needs electricity was in the south. So there was a very strong necessity of interconnecting the grid between where the generation was in, uh, uh, fed in, also in the north of Germany, and the, and the south. This was not done without difficulties because uh, people are not looking very favorable at new power lines. But still, I believe that this is part of the success. That's a very important point that you raise about the um, social license that we need for transmission network build out. Um, um, thank you for raising that. And, and, and an interesting point about the, uh, the transmission and interconnectors. I'm interested to hear from other members of the panel about uh, the degree to which that is a, um, I guess, a challenge within other, within, within other countries and other regions. Just checking if we might have Tanya Peacock online yet. I did see a flash up on the screen before from Bloom Energy. She may not be here yet. Um, over, I'm going to turn now to Tariq Durrani, who's sitting on our panel in the Scottish Events Campus. Tariq, um, what do you think is required for higher to allow for higher penetration of renewables and higher into, um, uh, share of renewables within our electricity grids? Well, thank you very much. And what I'd like to do really is to briefly share with colleagues uh, what has been happening in Scotland and what, did, what are the trends over the next period of time. So the first thing is that the Scottish government has made a legal commitment to reduce to net zero greenhouse gases by 2045. It's a very ambitious target. Uh, and the way in which it is progressing is a staged approach being taken to deliver interim goals of 75% emission reduction by 2030 and 90% by 2040. It has made a commitment to spend some, like, something of the order of about $2 billion to provide funding for transition into net zero economy. It has a 20-year vision for energy efficient zero carbon housing and about $600 million for infrastructure support for transportation. I'll just take one area at this stage and to talk about renewable energy. In the last 10 years to 2018, the Scottish greenhouse gas emission fell by 31%. Fossil fuel generation fell by more than 70% in the last decade. And by 2015, renewables became Scotland's largest power source and in 2018, Scottish Power, one of our large companies, was the first UK energy company to generate electricity from wind only. By 2020, Scotland had achieved a total of 97.4% of generating electricity demand by renewables. Its current targets are primarily to phase out petrol and diesel cars by 2030, ensure that 77% of electricity is being produced by 2020, and by 2018, it had ensured that 6% of heat demand in Scotland came from renewable sources. And I can expand upon that later on. But the whole idea is that there's a great push by the Scottish government to achieve these targets that are clearly carrots offered 
their sticks also, and more importantly, the, the local companies, particularly the major energy providers, are playing the game and delivering energy primarily from renewable sources. Fantastic case study that is, and it's really great to hear you lay it all out like that, Tariq. Can I ask you, how, how is that renewable energy being firmed? Primarily from offshore. Offshore, from offshore. Major, major offshore platforms, the huge offshore platforms all over the place, large wind farms that are being developed. And there are also compensating things because in some cases, part of Scotland has seen as the lung of the country. So there's been a major program of planting trees to offset any carbon uh, emissions. Um, there have also been programs in terms of ensuring that our transport system, which is by far the single largest source of greenhouse emissions, I think it's about 36%, is being replaced. Those of us who have been in Glasgow during COP26 would have noted that all transport that is being provided for delegates to come from different parts of the country to, to be here is based upon buses that are running on electricity or cells. So there is a, a, a process that is being employed to do this thing. I've already mentioned that target of ensuring that by 2030, all petrol and diesel cars are out of commission. There's clearly also work going on in terms of providing uh, programs to improve the quality of our built environment. The housing estate in Scotland covers something of the order of about 15% gas emission. Okay. And there is a program to move away from the that into. Environment a bit later, Tariq. Just uh, sure. we'll move that onto that in the next theme, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Let's just finish off on this topic of storage um, and and firming of the grid. Tom Jensen, I'm interested to hear from you. What, how important is that going to be in us being able to reach very high levels of renewable energy? So, so I think it's going to be fundamentally important and much more important than, than we might sort of consider today. So most people think about storage and batteries and lithium-ion batteries as something that will decarbonize the transportation sector. But across all scenarios in all different regions of the world, and Scotland is a great case example, that have you know already been punching way above their weight and actually been, let's say, achieving quite a lot. But we need to move from a very low renewable energy penetration in larger economies, right, which have a large degree still of coal dependence and natural gas dependence and so on, to one which is predominantly based on intermittent power sources. And in that, we would need to have robust grids, as pointed out earlier, but also storage, uh, both stationary uh, and so on. Uh, but changing this <clears throat> is, is something that is totally feasible and already, you know, on the drawing board. Uh, we will be uh, using energy in different places and in different ways. We will be using our vehicles, which will be electric and which will be charged up at some point uh, during the day or maybe during the night when, when electricity prices are cheap. And then they will be connected a large extent to the grid and can actually be a source of energy in a future more intelligent system. So, <clears throat> so in a way, we will have multiple different power sources at micro scale, all over the different sort of economies and, and locations where they're in, all again enabled by batteries. So the final thing I'd like to say is, the current estimate is that we're going to need about 20 terawatt hours of annual supply of batteries to basically enable the energy transition. And that is half of it goes into transportation and half of it goes into energy or uh, in storage to enable uh, energy systems to decarbonize. And the good news, again, back to what I've been saying before, and I cannot stress this enough, we know how to do this. It's a technology that has been developed over 30 years. The prices of those have come down by 90%. They can come down another you know, 50%, and we can improve the performance of them quite substantially. It's just a matter of building it and scaling it and rolling it out, and then we will see a renewable energy system, both on transportation and on energy systems globally. Mm, fantastic. So um, cost at the moment is not an impediment to uh, deployment of, of storage is a is a message there I'm getting from you, Tom, is that, or, is, or is it still at a point where it um, gives certain economies and networks a um, uh, pause for thought? Well, so, so just to sort of add on this, I think 
we are at an inflection point. The costs have come down by 90% over the last decade. Uh, I mean, it's obvious that they're going to keep declining over time. There are some temporary bottlenecks that we need to fix. But in this context, uh, it is absolutely very feasible to envisage that storage technologies for 20-year duration is going to be available in the coming years. It is not a matter of whether, it's a matter of how fast can we deploy them, how fast can we scale the solutions, how fast can the raw material supply chain play catch up in this. There is not a shortage of raw materials. There's a temporary debottlenecking that needs to happen. And if all parties come together around this common challenge, we will fix it. It is not a matter of a technology impediment. It is a matter of human will to actually get it done. To scale up. And look, that's a message that we're hearing too on the question of electrification, that electrification actually has a, a, a massive role and can do a large part of the decarbonisation task that we have over the next three decades. But it's not something necessarily well. This is where I'd like some um, thoughts from the, from the panel about to what degree electrification is being embraced. Have we seen any great examples of countries leaning into the electrification task. I know that, um, you know, the idea, for example, of giving up natural gas um, in some communities and economies is, is, is also um, uh, not necessarily something that every, everybody welcomes. Um, but what does, um, I guess, to what degree um, are we seeing electrification um, build momentum now? Um, I might start with Tariq, you were talking about the built environment before. Have you got some comments to provide on the question of electrification? Well, thank, thank you very much, Madam. I, I, I think uh, I'd sort of broaden the thing slightly by saying that Scotland is a small country and therefore a lot of things can happen. And there's a critical relationship between government, industry and academia to deliver on a whole host of targets. So, for example, in Scotland, at the present moment, there are some 2.5 million homes, which account for 16% of the nation's greenhouse emission. There is a program to drive towards 2045 net zero target by providing homes with support to move away from electricity and to use renewables such as low carbon, such as uh, heat pumps and biomass boilers. Um, it's, it's an expensive exercise, and yet the government and a number of agencies have been put in place to support this to happen. And there's a tracking that is going on to ensure that these science-based targets are being met. Um, Scotland's built, there's a, what's called this building strategy, which includes scaling up the installation of zero or low emission heating systems like heat pumps from to about 64,000 in the next five years. So there's a significant demand that has been identified. There are processes that are being put in place to deliver on these demands. I'd already mentioned the current issue with transport, which is by far the major source of carbon emission. And there are initiatives in place. There are subsidies to move drivers and others from electric or diesel vehicles to electric vehicles. And the hope really is that by 2030, we would have eliminated the use of cars and vans based upon petrol and diesel. Thank you. A amen to that. Um, he is hoping. I might turn to uh, Bruno Mayer to ask whether you might have some comments to make about the electrification transition and, and um, how straightforward do you think that might be and whether it's something you see um, different countries? I mean, how is Germany going, for example, in embracing electrification, Bruno? Thank you, Anna. Uh, I'm going to make a general comment. I believe that uh, reaching climate change mitigation needs the uh, sw a switch, a change to more electricity usage. We need to have a, a higher share of electricity consumption in the overall energy mix. In Europe, there is a, a, an overall, uh, 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 European Union, sorry, I should say, uh, there is what is called a, the Green Pact, uh, 
which aims at increasing the amount of electricity in our daily uses. This means transportation. Transportation will move to more electric transportation. Ele electric vehicles is one example, but also industry. And industry is moving very fast towards more electric processes. Uh, when they used to have fossil fuel-based uh, processes, they're moving to electric uh, processes. This is going very fast in Europe. I can see it in uh, industry in Germany, in France, in many countries. Of course, electric vehicles, uh, our colleague from Norway uh, mentioned the fact that this is, is going very fast. And I'm impressed at the way our environment is changing quicker than what was expected. So this is a very good news indeed. Thank you, Bruno. Um, Tom, uh, do you see that, um, I guess, if we need to take communities with us um, if, if there is, in fact, a large mass push on electrification. Do you, do you expect that that's going to meet some resistance at all? Or is it, uh, is it no, no difference to the quality of life that we can all um, expect? Well, I think <clears throat> Homo sapiens uh, is kind of, you know, uh, reluctant to change, right? I mean, change is challenging for, for many people. Uh, but I do think that, you know, we can learn how to adapt and learn how to change. And I think examples are, are strong in this regard. And therefore, back to sort of look to Norway, and I don't want to sort of overemphasize looking to Norway, but from the vantage point of electrification, I actually do think we have some, some quite important uh, lessons to be learned from others. So today, close to 90% of all vehicles that are being sold in Norway are electric in some way, shape or form. Two thirds of them are fully battery electric. And we started that journey some 10 years ago. Now we are fortunate because we are a filthy rich country, so we can actually afford to have some pretty decent incentives in place so that pe people actually buy electric vehicles. But we have been on that journey. We've been on that a range anxiety journey. We've been on the journey of installing uh, charging stations all over the country. We now know how to sort of live with charging your car at night, almost as when we adopted uh, mobile phones and we needed to charge them at night. That was a little bit of a headache 20 years ago. Now it's part of everyday life. So I think that's the same thing that you will see in electrification, not only for road transportation and not only for personal road transportation, but also for let's call it heavier transportation. But in Norway, we're now electrifying all the buses. We're electrifying all the ferries. We are even thinking about how to electrify the domestic aviation grid. And three, four, five years ago, that was impossible to envisage. But now we're seeing almost weekly new announcements of an electric you know, airplane going from A, a to Z with three, four, five people. And who is to say that you know, in five years from now, coupled with uh, hydrogen, that we can't fully electrify large parts of society. The final thing I'd like to say is, I mean, we have a 100% renewable energy system, at least for industrial use in Norway. Uh, and that is, of course, somewhat of a privileged situation to be in, that we have this massive hydropower base, which is really sort of flexible. But as the other nations look to how do we adopt these different systems, how do we integrate, you know, uh, charging up vehicles, how do we, you know, tap energy from the vehicles over time? How do we create integrated systems that aren't intermittent, but where the intermittency of the different input factors into it actually become, let's call it negatively correlated with each other so that we get a fully renewable energy system? That is totally possible to envisage, and it's only a matter of time. I believe we can do it faster than most people think. And I think, again, look to the power of the example. Mm, fantastic. What um, great inspiration there, particularly on the aviation front, which really feels um, um, very <laughs> depressing sometimes at the moment when you think how slowly change is happening there. Can I just ask you a very brief follow-up question, Tom? You mentioned um, what's been achieved in Norway and electrification for vehicles. Are you seeing, and that's been through policy and incentives, you know, direct intervention by government. Are you seeing that same level of policy and intervention happening on the built environment front? So I think clever intervention, right, on all levels is going to be required, uh, but it has to coincide with technology and cost development. We cannot sort of subsidize our way out of the problem. We have to incentivize business and technology to 
you know, get down on the cost curve and to get mm -hmm. up on the performance curve. Yeah. But that is all happening, and it's happening at an, you know, at an amazingly impressive pace. So that's why I'm extremely encouraged uh, around the, the sort of opportunity to electrify all parts of society. And, and we are not able to today, as we were not two, three years ago, we're not able to envisage the pace of change. Yeah. The pace of change is much faster, is much better than what we realize. And the governments are increasingly putting tighter and tighter regulations in place, which again creates this, from a electrification point of view, positive feedback loops that just ensures that we are on the right track. So we need to get up early in the morning. We need to invest a lot in you know batteries and, and renewable energy and wind farms and solar parks and, and grid stabilization and all of that. Yeah. But it's happening. We just yeah. need to yeah. give the momentum more fuel, yeah. preferably electricity. <laughs> nice one. Well, we might turn briefly to the question of energy efficiency because it is often the sort of uh, forgotten cousin in this whole um, uh, in the realm of um, emissions reduction within the energy sector. But it is incredibly important, and in fact, it is uh, one of the sort of most important um, no regrets measures when it's a policy pursued by governments. And I might turn to Professor Thomas Brook from technical the Technical University of Munich. Um, to, to share your thoughts, Thomas, about um, energy efficiency and how we need to consider that as we're designing approaches and strategies for the decarbonisation in energy. When we look at energy production, we have to distinguish between primary production and energy used in downstream processes, for example, to uh, generate chem uh, chemical commodities. So there's uh, an overall view on how to assess this in the primary sector, but in, in the secondary uses, it is not well established to look at energy efficiency as a whole. And all of that needs to be um, flanked by processes such as life cycle assessment, where you look at the energy input into a process and the energy storage or output you generate uh, by conducting this process. Um, I think here we're still at the beginning. Um, while um, Tom Jensen already uh, discussed all the issues involved with primary energy production, I think we are not um, there yet when it comes to generating commodities and also decarbonizing um, the building sector. Um, they're not only looking at um, energy usage, primary use by uh, inhabitants, but also looking at building materials. Um, there's a lot of energy and carbon being emitted by building materials, and there we have alternatives today um, that are more energy efficient. One of them being the use of algae to um, absorb CO2 and then turn this into carbon fiber or carbon fiber stone as materials that can act as a carbon sink at the end, and uh, that with a very energy efficient uh, process chain. So these are just one of the few examples that uh, still need development and further assessment and scaling. Um, so here we need to act fast and act more consolidated to uh, go beyond the current state of the art and achieve more energy efficiency in these particular um, sectors. So chemical sector and building sectors for me are still some work that needs to be done. And uh, also looking at hydrogen, maybe uh, also comment on this, uh, on uh, energy efficiency, just to decarbonize the um, mobility sector in Germany takes an electrical power of 380 gigawatts. Our current primary production is about 300 gigawatts. So there is more uh, energy um, efficiency needed in these processes to realize the hydrogen economy. And we also should not um, look at the single solution. We should be open to other technologies. And I think it's actually 
uh, a mix of different technologies depending on the locality where you have to implement those. And Norway, I think, is a very particularly um, favorable example because it is a large country with a lot of uh, shoreline where you can implement wind power um, and a small population. So realizing energy independence and energy neutrality uh, is easier accomplished than countries like Germany, for example. Um, well, while we got you on this question of um, energy efficiency, particularly in industry, and, and I'm really intrigued by the carbon fibre stone and carbon fibre sinks, I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit more from, from you and from Collier about that in, in about five minutes' time. But before then, can I ask you, um, do you see industries embracing energy efficiency as a, as a first stop measure as part of their decarbonisation journey? Or is it, um, or are there other things that are tending to be favoured? No, uh, energy efficiency comes particularly into play in those industries that are very energy intensive, and that's the steel and, and chemistry, for example. Um, but it's more due to the energy cost per se. So it's a cost-driven measure, yeah. number one. Uh, in Germany, one we have one of the highest energy costs, I think, around the world now. Um, the second is legislative measures. Yeah, um, so legislators clamp down on um, energy expenditure, um, and I think that's the right way to do it. Oh, this forces those industries to look harder at how to increase energy efficiency within those processes that they're conducting. Wow, novel. That seems like a novel approach to me to be legislating uh, energy efficiency in that way. I hear about it when it comes to home building stock um, and building homes for consumers, but that's interesting to hear it being used in the industry sphere. Let's move now to oh, Tariq. I was keen to give you an opportunity to comment on the question of energy efficiency as well. What, what, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to slightly change the topic and move away from power engineering energy at, and to look at information communications technologies, mobile technologies. These are massive industries and they, at the present moment, produce something of the order about 4% of uh, emission, uh, green gas emission. And that has been, in the last 10 years, a paradigm shift from what is seen as trying to reduce absolute energy consumption to look towards energy utilization efficiency. And this is being achieved by innovative design of systems using mechanisms that would save energy utilization of energy, I mean, ex exploiting software exploiting artificial intelligence to devise more efficient networks and more efficient um, base stations to save on energy, hence energy efficiency. Interestingly enough, one of the things that concerned me was the commitment that companies would be making, and this wasn't through legislation, but it was actually essentially trying to achieve science-based targets, and if I may just uh, share with you, AT&T, one of the largest telecom companies in the world, it aims to be carbon neutral by 2035. British Telecom, the largest communications company in Britain, wants to go net zero by 2045. Vodafone is eliminating emissions completely from its European networks and will be powered 100% by renewables by 2022. And these pledges are being accomplished by replacing energy transformation hungry equipment by energy efficient hardware and the use of modern innovations and use of AI driven algorithms and systems. So using tools such as cognitive radio intelligent management, they're able to deploy processes and procedures in place to achieve very significant levels of energy efficiency. In addition to that, you would all have heard about the transition in terms of the different types of technologies and 
mobile communications. The most recent one is 5G, which is better than 4G, but which clearly provides a smaller footprint in terms of utilization of um, greenhouse gases and in the employment of tools and techniques to essentially link different sensors and different devices to the network. That's called Internet of Things. And in addition to the expansion of this particular technology, it is interesting to note that the, the utilization of energy is reducing. So going back to your question, madam, the communications industry is very conscious of its footprint and is bringing to forth innovative ideas and tools and techniques to deliver on these. Mm, fantastic. And a lot of those things can be done relatively quickly. We have the tools, we have the strategies, we just have to get on with the job. Thank you, Tariq, um, for those comments. Now, let's turn to the question of things that we have considered over a period of time as harder to, to abate. We're going to hear about sectors that are even harder to abate than this one, but we've heard about renewable hydrogen um, a little bit earlier. And... Um, uh, Renewable hydrogen, as we know, is, is considered to be um, a real option uh, for those sectors where they're not easy to electrify. Um, I'm interested to see what, what advances that we're actually seeing in the areas of renewable hydrogen, renewable ammonia, bioenergy, um, and what it will take for uh, heavy industry in particular where th there's a real opportunity for these um, molecule fuels, clean molecule fuels to be used. What will it take for them to make the switch? Um, Bruno, I might ask you if you have a comment on this. Yes, thank you. Well, first I've got just a simple reminder. The paradox is that in the universe, hydrogen is the most uh, common element by far, but there is no hydrogen on Earth, basically. So to produce hydrogen, I mean, to have a hydrogen here, on Earth, we need to produce this. There are several ways, and hydrogen is used in industry today already, and basically it's an energy, I mean, it costs energy to generate hydrogen. As you mentioned rightly, Anna, one way of getting hydrogen is the idea of having uh, what people call green hydrogen, which is generating hydrogen through uh, renewable energy sources, I think this is a great idea. Uh, there is a very strong project in Europe on this issue. Many countries, Germany, France, amongst others, have been uh, uh, launching a very large hydrogen project, multi-billion uh, dollar projects. Uh, nevertheless, I want to say that uh, my own view is that there are different possibilities of, of where to invest in the development of hydrogen and not necessarily all options are the right ones, at least seen from me. Just to give you one number, if you want to use one kilowatt hour of electricity and have running a car, an electric vehicle, then you can run for seven kilometers with electricity batteries, but you can run only two and a half kilometers with hydrogen, which means that hydrogen costs more and we've got to be conscious of that. So my, in a nutshell, hydrogen is a, is a great solution for the future. Lots of developments are needed. I don't think that everything can be done through hydrogen because we've got to make choices, priorities of where to invest in the new topics using hydrogen. Yeah, great point. I mean, there's an energy efficiency question too in the terms of where, where we use to do, where we choose to deploy electrification and uh, clean fuels as the as the solutions. Um, I might um, now turn to the question of some of the even harder to abate um, areas of industrial activity. And Collier and Thomas. I really wanted to um, pick up on what you've been talking about earlier about carbon fibres and 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 other areas as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what are what where are the areas where electrification and renewable hydrogen aren't going to work, and and what are the solutions for those particular challenges? Do we have them yet, or are they still under development? What's needed in order to deploy those? 
May I start? You may. You may. Thank you. Sorry, that was that was a little bit inexact, wasn't it? Sorry, over to you, Thomas. Um, so I think the right word is prioritization. Where do you use hydrogen? Um, I, I do agree for uh, personal mobility, it is probably not the solution. Um, it might be a solution for other types of uh, processes that might be in the in the chemical sector and in certain sectors where you need liquid energy solutions. Uh, and that is certainly in the aviation sector. For the next 80 to 100 years, long distance flight will still rely on liquid energy carriers. Um, with that, we need to have technology solution and power to liquid, PTL, is one of them. And there, hydrogen is an integral part. It is not the only solution. Um, and here, I have to um, also put into um, the, the realm, basically, the production of hydrogen. Um, from the chemistry standpoint, I'm, I'm a chemist by training, you need the element iridium uh, to coat your electrolysis membrane to make uh, water splitting, to generate hydrogen and oxygen. The total production of iridium is 8,000 tons per year. And it's one of the limits that we have in expanding electrolysis on the larger scale. So it's a raw material issue. And this we have to take into consideration. And that's why I'm a true believer of having modular uh, solutions that can be implemented on different parts of the world, depending on the localities. So if, for example, algae are a solution not for Germany, but probably for Southern Europe, North Africa, and those sunny regions in Australia also. Yeah, there's a, there's a large algae technology in Australia that's happening, that's expanding rapidly. Mm. And you can produce, obviously, um, liquid fuels from this using oleogenous algae strains. You can assimilate um, CO2 from the atmosphere using this technology. But in addition to making energy carriers, in this process, you can make also materials. And one of them is the carbon fiber, which comes from a waste stream that's called glycerol. So glycerol is one of the parts that is not going to be used for making fuels. And that you can actually turn into carbon fibers using um, conventional chemical routes that are already established and scalable. Um, and here uh, we have a solution to really turn that CO2 that was assimilated biology into a form that's completely stable over geological time frames. The carbon fiber is the next stable form next to the diamond. Uh, there's no outgassing, nothing like this. You can store it into the ground and will, nothing will happen. Mm. And the technology that we devised was really focused on um, assimilating and eliminating CO2 from the atmosphere using this technology. And my group developed this front end part on cultivating algae and turning them into fuels and, and carbon fibers. And Collier's Kuse We may have just lost the network there, is it? Um, just, yes, maybe if you turn off your camera, Thomas, can you still hear us? Collier, I may ask you to take over at this point while we wait to try and get um, Dr. Brooke back with us. Um, I know that this has been a joint project that you've been working on or you've been associated with as well. Oh, here he is. Would you like to finish that statement? You may just need to turn off your camera and uh, I can't hear you at the moment, Thomas. Sorry, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. So to finish this statement, um, carbon fibers will give you the option to generate new lightweight materials that store atmospheric carbon and um, generate 
building materials, for example, in the building sector, but also in aviation and automotive um, that enable you to transform this sector into carbon negativity. Yeah? Well, um, what an exciting if you drive a plane. Yes, go. Yeah, as a final statement, if you fly a plane with liquid fuels that are made of CO2, if that's PTL or something else, it doesn't really matter, and they are made of carbon fibers, not only do you fly longer, you also fly with a lower carbon footprint in total. What an, what an um, um, can I can I ask? So carbon, the carbon fibre that you're looking at, you, you, that you would produce, could be used for what in particular? Building so, materials, you say. Uh, what what sort of the broad range of applications? So some broader range of applications. Of course, you know carbon fibre from the automotive industry. Uh, BMW has made the i8 out of carbon fibre. You can use it, the material there. Uh, you can use it also for making planes. Uh, the A320 uh, Neo from Airbus is already almost completely made of carbon fiber. And there are also alternatives in the building sector for making uh, houses. For example, we have generated a T-bar that substitutes steel or aluminium. Um, and we also made uh, demonstrators for house vaults, for example. But this is something that uh, Collier might want to elaborate a little bit more because it's his invention. Fair enough. Over to you, Collier. That's fascinating. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Uh, I take over. Uh, I, I prepared a little presentation to, to show you some pictures. Um, e E5 was renamed recently from the European uh, Business Council for Sustainable Energy into the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and Materials to really reflect uh, that we are talking about materials. I, I just uh, um, uh, commented uh, in my initial statement on, on this first slide that we need a scalable carbon sink. Thomas was talking about, and uh, the IPCCS are 1.5 states clearly uh, that, that we need these carbon sinks. Um, the existing building materials like aluminum, steel, and concrete uh, cannot become uh, a massive carbon sink because aluminium uh, and cement, for example, cannot be 100% de decarbonized. Steel can, but we need, uh, as we know, uh, lots of energies for this. And uh, carbon uh, storage solutions, which are scalable, will not come from these incumbents. So carbon fibers from algae oil uh, are mentioned actually in the SR 1.5. Um, in chapter 4.3.4.2, and the goal is to offer, on one hand, a solution to replace steel, cement, and plastics as mass building materials and combine it wherever possible with, with other CO2 negative uh, approaches like wood and, uh, for example, charcoal for, for insulation. Um, so it's, it's great that, that we have an opportunity, uh, thanks to Thomas Algi, to start talking about a real breakthrough through in material sciences, which is a, a new material that we are uh, uh, discovering, which is granite. So granite outperforms steel by a factor of two in terms of lightweight and pressure uh, strengths. Uh, it, it is much pressure stable than, uh, than steel with about a factor of 1.2, and it is 2.5 times lighter than steel. And and we need two times less production energy to make the material in, in com comparison to steel and steel concrete. So carbon fiber in combination as a mixed with stone, we call it CFS, is as light as aluminum and stronger than steel. So carbon fiber produc production can become highly carbon negative thanks to the algae growth, uh, which is mentioned in the SR 1.5, and stone production uh, is carbon negative as well because the waste we are generating uh, in making the stone uh, sheets um, will absorb CO2 through enhanced weathering of rock, which is uh, uh, currently discussed in climate science as well. On top of that, we have uh, developed ideas to, uh, to make the carbon fibers with focused sunlight uh, instead of uh, 
um, uh, en electrical energy. All of these materials are produced only with electrical energy today and uh, can be produced in the future eventually with the help of sunlight. So these are the algae farms as a production in uh, arid uh, uh, areas, uh, not competing with food production that Thomas was talking about. Large algae farms are existing already in Australia for winning of beta carotene. So that this is not rocket, rocket, rocket science technology. Um, from the algae, we have developed, uh, um, sorry, I forgot to, to uh, these pictures, to show these pictures. From, from the uh, algae development, we have developed uh, all the uh, process technologies to make the carbon fibers. Um, this is uh, typical stone manufacturing in Africa, uh, which is uh, not rocket science uh, too. And this is the, the project Thomas was talking about uh, that has uh, received fundings for seven million. So just to show you some examples what uh, the materials uh, look like that we make, for example, double T-beams within the framework of this project from uh, granite and carbon fiber. Uh, which are much lighter than steel, as you can see here, and will turn into products like uh, railway sleepers, um, uh, structural elements in the building sector, house wall, um, solar frames, uh, instead of using aluminum for photovoltaic modules, uh, and electrical heatings uh, that are made from very thin layers of uh, stone. Also structures in the car industry for example, housing of batteries will be possible. And we are also talking about carbon fibers that can be used in the future uh, to become structural batteries uh, to round up the possible uh, usage of carbon fibers. Thank you, Collier. Collier, I'll have to, um, we have to wrap it up on that presentation there, but can I just say how ex incredibly exciting this piece of work is? Um, that uh, you and Dr. Brooke have been working on, and I'm sure there are others that have been involved. Um, we now need to find a way to make the world as excited about algae um, as you are. I remember hearing it talked of about 20 years ago and um, having some raised eyebrows from the press. Um, but I, I, I really hope all strength to your arm in, in helping those that technology come through because it sounds like it has incredible potential. Um, let's move on to one last theme. Briefly, I wanted to hear from Tariq Durrani about the question of skills. And if you wouldn't mind keeping it brief, Tariq, but what, what, what do you envisage that we are going to need to be able to affect the seismic shift that we need in our economy, in our structures, in our, um, in our industries over the next three decades in order to be able to meet the challenge from a, from a workforce and skills perspective. Yeah, if, thank you very much. And I think the key requirement here is primarily to produce the right kind of engineers for the future. Engineers that understand what is meant by ambitious targets of net zero engineers who can understand what is meant by sustainability. At the present moment, our teaching is very much oriented towards teaching individuals in silos, be mechanical engineers or electrical engineers and so on. Whereas a number of initiatives are being taken here, I would compliment the Royal Academy of Engineering that established something called Engineering Zero. Through this, it is influencing curriculum, universities, accreditation bodies, to ensure that programs in engineering include a very significant element of young engineers understanding what is meant by sustainability. How do you need to achieve sustainability in the design, development, operations, management, re renovation of pro products and processes so that they are ready for this particular route we are taking towards carbon zero? It's, it's a, a, holi it's, a, it's, holistic, a holistic vision and a holistic approach to the way we, we think about systems and um, interactions and connectivity. Very much so. That's, yeah, that's a fantastic um, note to end on. And what I will do just before we finish up, we've got one minute, but I am going to ask each of you to share with me in 10 seconds or less one thing that you think we can be optimistic about. I will start with you, Collier. What should we be optimistic about in this race to net zero? 
we th should do exactly what Tarek said. We should throw all these ideas together into a big box and make calculations what portion for what kind of application will bring us to this 1.5 degree target. We have the solutions. We just need to bring them together. Tarek, all now, yes. You. Oh, I, I think I'm very, very optimistic because I think it's for the first time as far as COPs are concerned, we did not talk about what we should be doing or we could be doing, but really what we can do. And, and so I'm that's doing. a very important thing. The commitment that financiers have made towards meeting the 100 billion target, the fact that young people have recognized the value and are challenging us to meet the carbon zero targets. They want it done. Uh, Thomas Brook. I what think we feel at that point, um, realizing a true circular economy where we utilize our resources as efficiently as possible under social um, equality conditions where we uh, treat people equally and um, where industry is, is thriving through innovation of new technologies. It's a wonderful vision. Um, for our last word on this, I'm going to go to uh, Bruno Mayer. We have actually lost Tom Jensen over the course of the last um, 15 minutes and also Tanya Pe Peacock was unable to join us. Bruno, last word to you. What should we be optimistic about? Thank you, Anna. I am very optimistic. I see lots of new solutions being developed and proposed worldwide from different sectors of industry and researchers from universities. My pledge is that this sharing of technology and solutions continues, that many share these views. And I see young engineers wanting to join this industry, engineers and scientists, and I would encourage them to continue. And I think this is a great place to work. Thank you. Well, can I just thank you all? Um, it's been a really interesting discussion, an inspiring discussion, some great examples provided, Scotland's power transition, what's happening in Norway, um, and, of course, the clean materials breakthroughs that... Um, Let's hope they take over the world because we certainly need them. Um, it's been a session focused on solutions and opportunities and, and um, let's skip out of today's uh, COP uh, negotiations and, um, um, and meetings, etc., cetera, with, a, with um, some real positivity, uh, positivity about what we can achieve over the next three decades. Uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in um, and enjoy the rest of this week.